on the very edge. But from that, there was a message that Jesus gave to seven churches. Today we're discussing the church of Thyatira. Everyone say Thyatira. Thyatira. The church of Thyatira. As I've said before, all these church, church, uh, churches, all seven of them, were in what was Asia Minor, and today is called the nation of Turkey. And in the book of Revelations, Jesus is described as walking in the midst of the seven candle holders, and that is a menorah, and each candle holder represents each of the seven churches. We've talked about the church of Ephesus, I mean, if you recall, what was their problem? They left their first love. Then we talked about the church of Smyrna. The Lord didn't have anything bad to say about Smyrna. That was the persecuted church. You all recall? Then we talked about the church of Pergamon. And Pergamon had had a great witness who gave up his life. You all recall that? On the uh, altar of Zeus. And we talked about the throne and everything else. But their problem was that they uh, put up with some really bad teaching, okay? And today we're talking about and discussing and teaching on the Church of Thyatira. So let's get right into our lesson here today. <clears throat> then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and each lampstand represented one of those seven churches. And the Lord, by His Spirit, today has a message for you and I that relates to where we are on this planet here in the United States of America. Revelation 2.18, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now listen to me. Remember, every time our Lord begins a message to one of the seven churches, he reaches back to Revelation chapter 1 that describes all of his attributes and how he looks today. And we talk about how he looks today. How does he look? You see, he look like a, 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 a Viking with blonde hair and blue eyes? No. Or is his hair white like wool? His eyes are a flame of fire. His feet are like burnished bronze. That word varnished, burnished, literally means polished, okay? Super polished, super shiny. And then he goes on that he has a golden sash around the bottom. He has a white robe that reaches down to his feet. I mean, I want us, when we picture Jesus, to picture him how he looks today. It knocks some of the foolishness off of our life. Amen? Amen. Because we picture just Jesus being meek and mild, which he is, but we forget that not only is he the Lamb of God, he is also the what? Lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? In Revelation 1, 14, 15, this is where he reaches back to. It says, His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. Listen to me. How many of you have ever seen any sort of metal be refined? I'll tell you how it's refined. How they get the, the, the <coughs> metal, like... If you're refining gold, there with the gold that comes out of the ground, even how many of you have ever seen like these programs, Gold Rush or anything like that? How many of you have ever pan for gold? Anybody? Just me? Of course, I'm unique, weird. Listen, maybe it's a Jewish blood. You've panned for gold. All right. We actually, when Jude was small, when he was a little fella, where is he? We actually I bought concentrate dirt from eBay. And it's got gold, real gold in it and you have to sluice it. And so we had a, 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 a pan there, and he never wants to go gold hunting with me anymore, but it was fun, and we actually got some gold, and I sold it for like $60. But listen, that gold that you sell, it's really, we say it's pure, but it's really not pure, because they then take that gold, and they smelt it, they put it in a burning hot furnace, and this slag, it's called slag, it's like this, this black, metal that isn't gold that comes off to the top of it and they knock that off then you're left with the pure gold but it's got to go through the fire before it hits the pure gold how many of you know jesus went through the fire you know sometimes we think that we can comprehend and understand god's love and when i say god's love i'm talking about what jesus 
did for you and I as we look at Christmas, as we, as we look at the birth of Jesus. But I don't think that we've barely touched the surface of what Jesus did for you and I. He went through the fire. Think about it. You're God. You're the creator of the universe. And you're going to become a man. And instead of being born in a palace, which is overlooking the town of Bethlehem, you decide you're going to be born in where? A stinky, smelly cave. You ever walk in a cave that smells like bat water? You know what bat water is? Bat poop? Okay? It has this, this horrible odor. Kind of picture that, except instead of bat poop, it's sheep, 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 sheep poop. You can't say it. Sheep poop. Just stinky. I want you to picture stinky, nasty, dirty. How many of you would have your child and your baby born there? And then all that Jesus suffered. He was hunted by Herod as a baby. Remember, Herod killed all of the children, ages two and under, trying to hunt for Jesus. That's a part of the Christmas story you never hear about. Horrible, horrible. And then all that Jesus had to go through, here you are, the creator of the universe, all things, Colossians 1, were created through you and for you, and all things are held together by your power. And yet they mock you and spit on you and curse your very name, and to this day they use the name of Jesus as a curse all over the planet. How many of you know he's been through the fire? Amen. He's been through the fire. I just want you all to think of that for a moment. Revelations 2.19. This is Jesus' commendation to the church of Thyatira. Commendation means something good that you're doing. How many of you know wives? Always give your husband a little commendation. Don't, don't just give me grief. Amen? I know, honey, you're doing some things right. All the women said. Amen. Wow. That was not a... Uh, Workers. And then don't always find what your wives are doing wrong, but try to give them some commendation. Amen. Amen. <laughs> My wife worked six hours yesterday baking, bless her heart, for you guys. And uh, you say, for us, I'm very thankful for that. But I did have to make one gingerbread man. That was fine. I had to turn him Jewish. I had him, I had him wearing a yarmulke. Uh, a, a kippah had him wearing uh, some seat seats. He was a gingerbread man. You would appreciate it, brother. It's it cute. So we're going to save him. But anyway, she, she worked really, really, really hard. There's always good we can find. Amen. Jesus finds good in the church of Thyatira. And this is his commendation. I know your works. Everyone say your works. Your works. I know your love and faith and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. How many of you think, wow, man, I wish I were the church of Thyatira. That sounds awesome so far. And these were good things that Jesus is commending them. He says, I know your works. Do you in your life have works? Do you have works? This isn't for you to answer me. This is for you to answer the Holy Spirit. Do you have works? Is the extent of your works, like what Travis mentioned, we got up and we came to church on Sunday morning. I'll tell you this, what the Holy Spirit showed me in my life, and it's not good, that God's not nearly as impressed with me as, I'm in, as I am impressed with myself. I'm using myself as an example. Let me put it this way. God is not nearly as impressed with us as we are with ourselves. What do I mean by that? I mean, we really need to, every day, be heartfelt, honest, where we're at with Jesus. Amen? Every day. Man, Pastor, you always talk about loving God with all your heart. That's what it's about. Amen. That's what it's about. Amen? Mm -hmm. Loving Him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your might. And when you do, it changes your life. It changes your focus, changes your priority, and changes what kind of works you're working how many of you know everybody's going to use up their 24 hours in their day doing something? Am I right? Yes. Saved or unsaved, they've got the same 24 hours, don't they, James, that you have and that I have. No different. The only difference is, as believers, do we have any works? Your labor, your accomplishments, 
that which occupies your time. Jesus said that their latter works exceeded the first. Is this true of you? How many of you have been serving Jesus between zero and three years? I mean, walking really right with God, not a pray to prayer 20 years ago, but walking right with the Lord, you've been serving him less than three years. Raise your hand. Less than 10 years. Raise your hand. Less than 20 years. Raise your hand. Okay? Less than 30 years. Okay? And then the rest of us. Now, listen to me. The question is, are we doing more for the kingdom now than we did when we first started walking with Jesus? The church of Thyatira was. He says, your works now, look, and your latter works, what you're doing towards the end, exceed. What's exceed mean? It means it's more than. More than the works you did at first. Listen. It drives me crazy when I meet Christians and they're always talking about, I used to, I used to, I used to, I used to. How many of you know we don't serve the I used to, we serve the what? I am. I am. Everyone say I am. I am. I am that I am and I will always be. That's what the Lord says. Amen? He's not the God of I used to. He's the God of today. I am today. So what I'm saying is this. These guys... They were doing more for the Lord now than ever before. And I hope that's where you are in your life. I pray that's where I am in my life. I know your service. Everyone say service. service. Are you serving something greater than yourself? <coughs> greater than yourself. You know what Travis said, we kind of laughed, but God bless him for his honesty. He said, most of the time, I think about who? Myself. Truth is, guys, we're all there. That's something we have to wrestle with. How often? All the time. Every day. If anyone chooses to be my disciple, let him deny himself. himself. Take up his cross and follow me. That denying himself is an everyday event. Why? Because our fallen nature is that nature of selfishness. It desires to please itself. Amen? Amen? You don't believe that. Just get in one of your moods one day where it's all about you all the time and whoa, whoa, whoa to the spouse or the relative or anybody else who tries to get you to get off of that mood. Come on, guys. We all have it. Amen? Amen. We all wrestle with these things. So he says, Jesus says to the church of Thyatira, I know your service. They were serving something. Your labor of ministry to others, your selfless help to others. The church of Thyatira, they were serving. They weren't about themselves, they were about others. Sounds pretty darn good so far, doesn't it? And lastly, it says, I know your patient endurance. Everyone say patient endurance. Patient endurance. Are, your, are you cheerful and hopeful, patiently waiting? Are you patiently waiting for God to bring about the answers to your prayers, to bring about the things you've been praying about, and are you doing it cheerfully and with hope? Or you mumble and gripe and complain all the time about everything, thus missing out on God's blessings in your life? Don't answer that. <laughs> Come on, we all are guilty of some of that, amen? I can't be the only one amongst us who ever complains to the Lord about anything. Yeah. <laughs> Loyal to faith, even with the greatest of trials and sufferings. That's what patient endurance is, guys. You are loyal to the faith in Jesus, even if you go through fiery trials and suffering. You know, there's some believers in these other countries, guys, I tell you this every week, who have had their property. Can you imagine? Let me put it where you live. How many of you guys have worked really hard for your house and for your possessions? And they, they mean something to you. You don't like worship, but I mean, you care about the things that you have. Am I right? How would you feel if somebody came to your home and confiscated it all or threatened to confiscate it and said, Brother Larry, they wouldn't call you brother. They said, Larry, either deny your faith in Jesus or I'm going to take your home, your property, and everything in it. And Larry would say, no way, I'm not denying my faith. 
Then you lose your home and you lose all your stuff. That's what these people are going through, guys. And it just sometimes, I think we just, it's so far away, it doesn't like, like affect us or glaze us. And we need to recognize, these are real people with real emotions, with real families, with real property or had property. They've lost homes, careers, jobs. And then they say, if you don't convert to Muslim or Islam, tell you what, we're going to take off your head or you're going to pay us a tax. Well, if you have no money, you can't pay a tax. And so what do you do? You're not going to deny your faith, so they end up being executed. These people are patiently enduring. Okay, So this stuff's been going on for thousands of years, but it's increasing in the day in which we live. And I want to bring that to your attention. So the Church of Thyatira, they were patiently enduring these things as well. Now, look at verse 20. Revelation, now this is the Lord's critique. With this commendation, oftentimes, except to the Church of Smyrna, and except to the Church of Philadelphia, comes a critique. Critique is, this is an area that you need to improve or you need to repent of. Amen? But, everyone say but. But, but I have this against you. Never a good thing when the Lord starts off a sentence like that. Amen? <laughs> Right to the church. You know, there's some Christians that think that the Lord is like this, this sweet little lollipop in heaven who just is always smiling at you no matter what you do. And I'm telling you, that is not the God of the Bible. Amen? Amen. Now, he's precious, and he is holy, and he is merciful. But he demands, and he commands us to follow him, to follow him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Listen to me. It says... But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Everybody say Jezebel. Jezebel. Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, we don't do that here, but back in that day, what they would do is they would, uh, they had these idols in the Roman Empire, and people would bring their, their, their lambs, and they'd bring their goats, and they would make sacrifices to these idols, okay? But it was a lot of meat. And so then the meat markets would then sell that meat that had been slaughtered on the altar of a false god. You follow me? So that's kind of the thinking here. And uh, let's continue. It says, I gave her, Jezebel, time to repent. But she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. All right. Now, we're going to talk about Jezebel. But one of the things about Jezebel within this church was the sexual perversion and sexual immorality that was there. Now, listen to me, guys. And I've said this. And I'll continue to say this. This is an issue in the body of Christ because there is as much sexual sin in the body of Messiah as there is in the world amongst unbelievers. As if God suddenly has changed his mind on these things, as if he doesn't care. And then we have preachers who never say anything, never teach, never expect people to live differently. Now I'm not talking about, and I want you to hear me, there's a difference between the unbeliever who comes in through the doors, they're living together, they just, I mean, their first time hearing the word of God and they get saved, You've got to allow opportunity and room for God's Spirit to work on them. Someone say that. Amen. Amen. That's a far cry from the person who's been going to church for 15 years, threw away their spouse, and now shacked up with somebody else. Who knows the Word of God, who knows right from wrong, and knows the truth. God doesn't see them equal. Do you understand me? I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. We cannot allow this culture to dictate. I want you to hear me, young people. We cannot allow this culture to dictate our response to God's holiness. Because the world says it's okay if you sleep around. The world says it's okay if you uh, have sexual relations before you're married. It's not even frowned on in places anymore. I mean, the schools, they're giving out condoms. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. But for the believer in Jesus, I want you to hear me. God has a totally holy standard, and that standard has not changed. Amen? Young and old alike, 
We need to live and live right for God. Amen? Now, how many of you know? Temptation comes. Young people, temptation will come. How do I know that? Because you're human. You're growing. There's hormonal things going on. I get all that. But listen, temptation's not sin. Sin is when you give in to that. You have the power of God's Spirit to say no. To say no. Everyone say, say no. Say no. Say no. Say no. Remember, uh, who was it? Ronald Reagan, that old saying about drugs, just say no. Now they've legalized that too in all these places. Anyway, let's go on. The critique, this is the characteristics of this Jezebel spirit. And you need to understand, Jezebel is not about a person named Jezebel. Okay? It's about a spirit. Everybody say a spirit. spirit. Now, how many of you know there's God's spirit and there's demonic spirits? Amen? So this Jezebel is a Jezebel spirit. It's a demonic entity or a spirit that's at work in this church in Thyatira. And part of what it's at work doing is allowing... God's people to become involved in sexual immorality and perversion without thinking there's any consequences before God to it and teaching it's okay to do those things. What does that sound like to you today? She considers herself, this prophetess, this Jezebel spirit, to be extremely spiritual. Everybody say extremely spiritual. Guiding others as a prophetess. Listen, I'll be honest with you guys. You'd say, well, we'd expect nothing less from you, Pastor. I need to come up with a different thing. I'm going to be very honest with y'all. She, anytime somebody comes and they appear to be overly spiritual, it's like fake, like plastic, like the gift wrapping looks right, but the inside doesn't feel right. Probably isn't yours. Exactly. Jezebel comes across as extremely spiritual. Why? Because she calls herself a prophetess. What does that mean? She's guiding others, telling them this is what God wants for your life. This is what God expects for your life. I have an issue. I'm going to say you have a lot of issues with a lot of things, Pastor. I have an issue with the whole Christian counseling thing that these people are licensed Christian counselors. Nothing wrong with Christian counseling if it's advice based on scripture. Amen. But it's when it's human and humanism and human wisdom and the wisdom of man giving advice, telling these people, you know what? You just need to leave that man. You just need to leave that woman. Or you know, they shouldn't talk to you that way. You just need to divorce them. Things that are absolutely opposite to the word of God that talks about patiently enduring. Amen? And so this spirit of Jezebel, guys, it's at work everywhere. It's when people claim to be spiritual are giving advice to others, but the advice that they are giving is opposite, everybody say opposite. Opposite, opposite or contrary to God's word. That should scare us. Now, if we know God's word, then we can say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. But not everybody knows God's word like they should. And many people, many people are deceived. I sat down with a woman a few weeks ago saying she went in and talked to a Christian counselor trying to tell her why she shouldn't be praying and believing God for the restoration of her marriage. People try to say what they think you want to hear. And that is not what Jesus does. Most of the time he tells us what we don't want to hear, what we don't want to know. Amen. She always speaks and craves attention, the spirit of Jezebel. It's about them. Me, look at me. I've been in churches where that spirit's been prevailing. You're trying to worship and somebody's just doing hula hoops. And it's all about them all the time. And I'll tell you what, guys, the only person this thing's about is about Jesus. Amen. All the time. Amen. The spirit of Jezebel seduces through her words the permission for God's people to engage in sexual immorality. Well, how is that possible? Well, you know what? You hear her whisper in your ear, you're under grace. It's okay. You go to church. You can do this. You see what I'm saying? And it's that whispering, evil, demonic spirit 
And it comes through people who claim God's name. That's what we need to be careful of. Because that, brothers and sisters, is the spirit of Jezebel. And it is everywhere. Everywhere. This is done by changing God's word to fit the culture. Don't we have that today? We have whole denominations now. We have entire churches, even some that are supposed to be spirit-filled, charismatic or Pentecostal churches that have now gone and swayed with the culture saying, it's okay, we're going to accept homosexuals into leadership, we're going to, no repentance required. How I many of you know God loves a homosexual individual? But he loves them enough to require repentance and change, just like every other sexual perversion. Well, they don't call it sexual perversion. I don't call, care what they call it. God's word is what it is. Amen? Everybody say, it is what it is. Listen, you can call murder, not murder. It doesn't change what it is. Amen. And you know, it's so funny. They should have posted all these words and all these things. And there's guys, and you're being arrested for saying what I just said. That homosexuality is sexual perversion. It's called hate speech now. Take me away. I don't care. This is done by changing God's word to fit the culture. How many of you know we never, ever change God's word to fit the culture? Now, we can change the walls. We can change the decoration. You can change the lighting. You can change anything, but you can't change God's word to fit the culture. Amen? His word is immutable, unchangeable. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will abide forever. How long is that? That's the time I checked. Forever. Forever. <laughs> Characteristics of the Jezebel spirit seduces through her words the permission for God's people to call evil good. Isn't that where we're at today? People are calling that which is evil. Even in churches, they're calling that which is evil good. Anything goes, there are no consequences for actions. This is that Jezebel spirit. This is that turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. The grace of God into lasciviousness. Where God's grace covers anything you do, no matter what you do. Instead of, it's the grace of God that instructs us to say no to ungodliness. Amen? God's grace is a teacher instructs us to say no to ungodliness. It doesn't cover you like umbrellas so you can live like the heathen. Amen. 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 Eating meat sacrificed to idols. No big deal. Just a little paganism. No big deal. Listen, guys. We need to start thinking what God thinks. And it's hard. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need the Holy Spirit to help us to be pure in these end times. Act like the unbelievers, no big deal. And don't we have that? The church of Thyatira had people in it. The people in the church looked like just like the people in the world. There was no separation, no difference. But I thought they had works. They did. I thought they had service. They did. Man, listen, there's some churches, God, they're doing great things. Jesus not faulting them for some of those things and some of the service. Building a hospital, all these, well, he's faulting them for is what? Putting up with the evil in their midst. This spirit of Jezebel. Revelation 2.24, But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, Hallelujah. That'd be us. Amen? Someone say amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor. Say he's talking about you. Talking about you. To the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. Listen, I'm not interested in learning the deep things of Satan. I'm interested in learning the deep things of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast. Everyone say hold fast. Hold fast till I come. Now, you know what I think of when I think of hold fast? Again, I always think of that silly poster. Yeah, I picture the cat. You ever see a poster of that cat? He's on a chin-up bar, 
He's like, hold on for dear life. Hold fast until I come. Amen. Hold fast until I come. Man, don't give up. Don't give in. Don't quit. Hold fast. Look at your neighbor and say, hold fast. Hold fast. Be careful what you hear. Okay? Be careful what you hear about. It. There's all kinds of teachings out there. They have what I, I call them PC heroes. You know what a PC hero? Y'all know what a PC is, right? Mm -hmm. a PC is a computer. Okay? A PC hero is somebody who gets their scholarly information off the internet. And they have some new fandangle teaching that they're giving. Listen, you can find anything and everything on the internet, guys. Doesn't make it true. Okay? Don't get your doctrine from anywhere but God's Word and God's Spirit. Amen? Because there is all manner of voices out there. Be careful what you hear. Hold fast. Everybody say hold fast. Hold hang fast. on. You know what I think of hang on? I think of hanging on. Now here, this is funny because I'm not thinking of hanging on for dear life and there's a cliff under you. I'm thinking, in this case, hang on. It's like there's a race car and you're hanging on for dear life so you don't fall off the roof while I'm sipping along. Listen to me. God's spirit is moving in these end times. People are getting saved. Nations, Cambodia. Do you realize that Cambodia has seen over a million and a half people come to Christ in the last year and a half? A million and a half. And that's just through the four square churches. That's not even through the other groups of Christian believers who are out there ministering. God is moving. Muslims are having dreams. Bibles are being downloaded by the millions in Iran. The Spirit of God is moving, even when we're not. So I want to say hallelujah. <laughs> even when we're not, you ever feel like you're not moving? I do. I feel like, Lord, all this is going on. I feel like I'm just not going anywhere. But God's moving. We serve a mighty big God. Amen. And he says, hold on. Everybody say, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. They'll take you for a ride. Amen. Behold, I will throw her, Jezebel, into a sickbed. Those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation. Wow. So those folk, I hate to tell you, but I think that uh, the scripture is pretty plain here. They're going to be staying behind during the tribulation. Thrown into great tribulation. Unless they what? Repent, Repent of her works. Whose works did they do in Jezebel's? What works were those? Sexual immorality. Everyone say sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. sexual immorality. sexual immorality. Those were her works. Okay. And I will strike her children dead. That's talking about the offspring of Jezebel, those who follow her teachings. Listen, it's hard to stay alive during the tribulation. You can read about it in the scripture. Okay. There's a lot of that you don't want to be thrown into. Amen. And it says, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your what? According to your works. Do you have any works? My prayer is that this congregation, not one of you, will be spiritually bankrupt when it comes to eternal rewards. They will be left here and go through the great tribulation. Jezebel's fruit and offspring will die in tribulation. The one who conquers, here we are, we're at the end. The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And what we say that word conquer means? It means to prevail. Everyone say to prevail. To prevail, to prevail with God. Whose name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Jacob, he wrestled with God. His name was changed to Israel. Israel means, the name means to prevail with God. You and I are called to conquer, to prevail with God. And who keeps my works, everybody say his works. His, his works. works. his works till the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. We must conquer, we must keep his works until the end. And the prize is not to him who starts the race, but to him who finishes it. Amen? Amen? Listen to me, let me say that again. The prize is not to he who starts the race. Oh, you know, so-and-so prayed a prayer 15 years ago. Where are they at now? Not even walking with Christ. Big whoop-de-to-do. I'm being 
being serious. The issue is not, they prayed a prayer 15 years ago, the issue is not how we start the race, but how we finish. Are they walking with God today? If not, we need to reach out to them in love and bring them back to the kingdom. Amen? And in your own life, it's not how fast you started out at the gate. You ever see one of these marathon runners, guys? They hit the, uh, 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 what do they call this? And the, um, pistol, starting, starting, what's it called? Flare gun. Flare gun. They hit the flare gun, the pistol, whatever. Fireworks. Makes a loud bang. And man, have you ever seen an inexperienced marathon runner? He starts off at a dead heat, boy. He's just running. But after like the, the first little bit, he's pooping out. Now all those guys who are running real slow are passing him. Just kind of waving. Hell you do. You start out pretty fast now. But now where are you at? It's how a lot of people are in the kingdom, man. They start out. Gunshots. Wow. Well, where are they at five years, ten years, twenty years? He rewards us with authority over the nations in the restoration of all things. Amen? Hallelujah. And lastly, he says, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. Amen. Listen to me, saints. What is the morning star? <coughs> what, what your reward is the morning star? I had to pray on this one and think about it. All right, the morning star. What am I going to do with the morning star? How many of you know what the morning star is? It's the star that's first seen at dawn. And what he's saying is he'll give you a new dawn. A new day. How many of you there know there is a new day? It's called the thousand year reign of Christ, the new millennium. A new kingdom that's coming. Amen. Amen. Yes. His kingdom come, his will be done. The morning star gives you the ability to enter into that new day. That's a heck of a reward. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord on that day. Enter into the kingdom. Your reward is the morning star, the dawn of a new day, and you're allowed to come in. Amen. Man, this, you make it sound like serious stuff. Deadly serious, guys. Unquestionably, incredibly serious. That's why I preach and teach the way I do. So I hope it's had an effect in your heart. Let's all stand for